today is all about Volkswagen. And they, <coughs> you might, <coughs> might have noticed <coughs> that <coughs> they've had a, <coughs> had a few problems recently with their emissions, but um, <coughs> I think they might have sorted them. Let's have a look. I know, I know, it, it's a cheap shot. And um, the thing is, what I don't want to do today is get hung up on uh, what's happened with Volkswagen and how they've ended up effectively having to produce an electric car. Because let's look at it logically, without all this happening, then probably they and a number of other people, as in manufacturers, wouldn't actually now be in the position they're in trying to produce electric vehicles because it's let's be honest it's come about because of emissions emission rules and the fact that actually however they thought they could get around it or address it they now can so other manufacturers are now having to look at ways to make their cars work and with ever increasing demands on emission rules we're seeing probably 2020 there's going to be another clamp down manufacturers are having to rethink their strategy now based on what they're seeing at Volkswagen and the fact that Volkswagen can't get away with it anymore. So as a result, I think what we're seeing is a lots of uh, EVs being announced are gonna be released in 2020 as a direct result of what's happened to Volkswagen and how they have to address their emissions moving forward. And no other manufacturer wants to get caught up in that but time will tell and we'll see what happens. So that's all I wanna say on that. Let's put the negatives to one side. I know some of the PR hasn't been great around it and I know we keep seeing other news stories relating to Volkswagen that probably aren't the best, but let's stick with the positives today. Let's look at what they're doing to address it and the fact that actually they are addressing it or they seem to be addressing it more so than a lot of other manufacturers. And the way they're addressing it is by what appears to be not just PR, but a full frontal attack on producing new electric vehicles, electric vehicles that are effectively gonna replace their whole fleet moving forward in the years to come. And let's remember VW isn't just VW, it's Audi, it's Skoda. Uh, there's a number of other companies from the budget up to Porsche, they're, they all come under that same umbrella. So they're all working together. And it's important for uh, VW to get a common platform, a common platform to build their electric vehicles on because that's how they've had success in the past. You look at the MQB platform that they used, that was used on things like the um, Audi A3 and the VW Jetta. They have a chassis, a, an underpinning of a car that then they just replace the components on top. It keeps costs down, it means that it's more economical uh, in the manufacturing process, and it means that between the sub-brands within the company, they can build lots of different vehicles at lots, lots of different price ranges. So it makes sense that they take the success from that that they've learned over many, many years and move it into electric vehicles, and that's exactly what they're going to do. Uh, and they, they're being quite bold in it. They're saying that in the year of 2020, they want to sell 150,000 units globally. Well, if you think the Nissan Leaf from the time it was launched until January 2018 had sold 300,000, you see just how ambitious they are in the first year alone. And then within five years, they're talking about 1 million units being sold worldwide. So that's all well and good, plucking figures out of the air, but what are they gonna base it on? What's this? underpinning gonna look like? Well, they're calling it the MEB, Modular Electric Drive Matrix is what it, um, it's, it is in English. And um, I've got some notes here about how it's gonna look. They're talking about having a modular chassis with um, a few variables on it, but ultimately it's gonna be much the same. So they're gonna have two wheelbases, uh, a short and a longer one, and two dash to axle proportions. So that between the wheelbases and the proportions of the dash to axle, that gives the vehicle the shape it needs, depending on whether it's um, you know, like the bus or the, a saloon car, uh, whatever it needs to be, they can just jiggle about on that geometry uh, and make it work. They said it should accommodate, and this is interesting because this obviously gives us a bit of an idea about what they're looking at. It should accommodate compact cars, crossovers, and sedan slope saloons, depending where you are in the world and what you want to call them. So, 
We know crossovers, SUVs, that sort of vehicle are very, very popular at the moment. They're everywhere. Now, it's going to have uh, potentially electric motors at either end. It's going to have a flat battery pack, which is going to sit low down in the middle. So that center of gravity is going to be, that's kind of the, I guess, the, the big selling point of electric vehicles, isn't it? That low center of gravity that seems to work so well. Uh, default for it will be rear wheel drive, but they've got an all wheel drive option. And what they've said as far as that's concerned is they want to try and stay away from front wheel drive. The reason being they mentioned the Golf again and say just how skitty it is on the front wheels with all that power going through it. Now they've got that option just to put it in the back because before it might have cost a little bit more to move the, the drive to the rear wheels, where now they don't have to worry about that. It, um, it's nowhere near as expensive to build. Now the motors themselves, they're gonna be the same in all the cars. So that means they just have to build one motor, which has got a uh, single speed reduction gearbox in it. And that paired with the software that it can be programmed with will give it the different power, if you like. So it, depending on which vehicle you buy, uh, which class you buy it in, those motors can produce different power or a different amount of power. And also what the chassis allows for is uh, because there's no engine effectively at the front, everything can be moved apart. So the, um, the, the motors, if there's one front, one back, can be pushed right to the, the extremities. The battery lays flat on the floor, which means there's no drivetrain throughout the middle of the car, so that can sit flat. But also because the battery's there, it allows the passengers to sit up a little bit higher. And we've seen this with these SUVs, etc. People like that seating position. They actually prefer, and. Um, Volkswagen mentioned this in their press release, that they found that their customers prefer that higher driving position. I'm not talking four by four higher, I'm just talking about sitting a bit prouder in your saloon car, able to see the road around you. So this chassis has been built specifically to allow that, to bring the seating up, which um, clearly if, if you're listening to your customers, that's gotta be a good thing. Now, as far as cost is concerned, obviously we're still crying out for that affordable mass produced electric vehicle that we can all go out and buy whether it's brand new second hand volkswagen have got a long history of making okay not the most affordable cars but certainly cars for the masses let's be honest that's what the beetle was for wasn't it so hopefully uh, they will build this vehicle using materials that will allow them to price it competitively. And that's exactly what they've said. They've um, looked at carbon fiber and all the other materials that they could potentially use. And they've said, actually, the majority of what this is built with is gonna be steel. And steel is cheap or cheaper than most of these other uh, materials. So that will keep the cost down. So matching materials that are relatively cheap compared to some of the others that are used and the fact that they're going to be able to mass produce this for all their vehicles on a huge scale. Economies of scale come into play and hopefully that will keep the cost down. And certainly we're not just talking about the here and now, they need to future proof it so they don't have to spend lots of money in the future trying to adapt it to new technologies. So uh, they've made room for inductive charging underneath in case that becomes a reality. They've, um, there's a head up display module ready to be used within it. Um, there's modules in there ready to be fitted with uh, autonomous driving. So they've really thought about not just the here and now, but moving forward over the next five, maybe 10 years, uh, and how those new technologies are gonna fit in. It also gives us a really good insight into what they're thinking. If they're thinking about these things, they must have some development going on. So for me, that just makes it even more exciting because there's so many things coming along so quickly now. And if a company like VW are looking at it, then, we've got to be pretty sure that these things are going to happen and happen in the short to medium range. Now, I've spoken about the battery packs there and where they're going to sit quite low down, uh, but they've actually also given us a really good guide as to what those battery packs are going to actually physically look like. Now, they're going to be supplied by LG Chem and Samsung, so very well established battery pack um, makers or battery makers. They, um, they've said that they're going to have two sizes, a 48 and a 62 kilowatt hour one. Now, that obviously sits in quite nicely with where we are at the moment and we know what those ranges are like. So um, certainly with a 62 kilowatt hour battery pack, uh, that's a really good range, which should be a nice balance between cost and the range you're able to drive, which is great. Charge times are still really, really important. And uh, we know that it's not just about 
the chargers and how quick they can put the charge in, but it's also about how the battery manages itself within the car. So the battery is gonna be liquid cooled, so no worries about them overheating. They will look after themselves, much like the Tesla battery packs do. Um, the charge rate will, um, they'll be able to charge at 100 kilowatts. So that's gonna be an awful lot quicker than most of the batteries that we see currently on the market, or certainly what the chargers can supply. So that again is a nod to the future. That's where everything's going. I think 100 kilowatts is gonna very quickly become the norm. That's gonna be our base charging rate. So already they're, they're gonna be set up ready to accept that and should, if liquid cooled, be able to charge at that rate no matter how far, how fast, how hard you drive the car, which is good news. And what they're saying is, certainly when they're up to speed, is they want to produce over 500,000 battery packs per year. And they've shown their commitment to that with an investment of $48 billion back in May of um, 2018. So that's that for them really is them laying down the mark to say, we are taking this seriously, we are gonna do things properly. And they've put further investment into uh, 16 factories that they've identified that they're gonna adapt build or change in order to build these EVs. So really driving things forward with the factories. Um, the cost, now the cost of these vehicles, I've touched on a couple of times, but they've, whilst they haven't obviously released a price because we're still uh, a year or so away from the first one um, rolling off the production line, what they've said is that the cost of each vehicle should cost no more than its diesel equivalent. So we know that obviously there's a Golf equivalent coming along. So if you look at the diesel Golf, the equivalent spec electric vehicle that they're gonna build should cost the same, which is another big marker for us. This is what we've been waiting for. This is one of the biggest criticisms of electric vehicles of how much more expensive they are than their diesel equivalent. Now, obviously I've done videos in the past that shows over the lifetime of a car, actually you get that money back and some. But if you can start off on a level par, the economies are going to be so much better and we're going to get uh, much more value for our money. So uh, again, uh, they've really stuck their neck out here and I know they're on a full on PR offensive at the moment, but these are tangible things that we're going to be able to judge them on as and when they start producing these cars. So we've spoken about the platform that these vehicles are going to be built on and the fact it's not just VW, it's all their sister companies as well. Let's have a look at some of the things that, or the vehicles that have been announced. I'm not saying these are definitely gonna be built, but the fact that they're listing them and naming them, I think there's a pretty good chance these are gonna come along. So some of the ones we can expect to see on Audi, uh, they haven't named it, but they're talking about a small SUV, which will be obviously uh, in the Audi price range and the spec that you would expect to get from them. See it, have said that uh, by 2020, they're going to produce a model with a reported range of 500 kilometers. Where they've got that from, I don't know, but that might not be a million miles off those battery sizes we're talking about. And then two unspecified models to be produced before 2025. At Skoda, they've said a Skoda Vision E, which uh, they hope to have in full production by 2020. And by 2022, a hatchback of some description. Volkswagen themselves have said that uh, they will have the ID, which, um, I think has been named now, um, but it's a bit unclear. I'll have to look it up. If it has, I'll put something in the description. But the ID effectively is going to be the, the Golf um, equivalent, which uh, we keep seeing rolled out, and it does look like a very nice car. Uh, not a million miles away from a Golf, just a very modern version of it. Um, they reckon that will be in production by the end of November 2019, so that's effectively gonna be their first one. Uh, the ID Cross which is uh, an SUV type vehicle or crossover vehicle. Uh, they say, said that that should be in production by 2020. Uh, the ID Buzz, which is the camper van that we've all seen everywhere. It looks stunning. Uh, I dread to think how much the thing is gonna cost, but I will certainly be looking at one because it just looks like the perfect family vehicle. Uh, yeah, the, the, ID, the VW camper van to me looks like a perfect family vehicle, but they're so uneconomical that I couldn't justify running one day in, day out. Perhaps I could if it had a battery in it, but we'll see. And finally, the, the Vision, which um, I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm sure you let me know if it's not. It, um, it looks like a, a, a kind of a, a sedan type car. Um, so obviously thinking about their uh, company market and the type of people that are gonna drive that. So they're the ones that have been announced straight off the bat. And they, um, 
they look like they cover a nice wide range of vehicles. So hopefully by, certainly by 2025, with all of those in production, and then you take into account all the other manufacturers that buy them, which will be forced on board, we should have a really good selection of electric vehicles. And while we've gone the last two years of saying, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, eventually they'll be affordable, eventually you'll be able to buy the car that suits your needs. Actually, now we've got some real tangible evidence that the big manufacturers are heading that way. So that's a, a whistle-stop tour of what uh, Volkswagen have said they're gonna do. And um, hopefully it's given you a bit of an idea and a bit of hope for the future, because we have, I think, just been stuck a little bit in a kind of a nothing area for a while, of no real development happening and nothing really exciting moving forward. Uh, it looks like it's all about to start in the next 12 months. So um, hopefully that's given you an insight. If it has uh, and you've enjoyed it, remember to like and share the video. And if you're not doing so already, subscribe to the channel. And uh, you can always uh, contact me through the comments here or have a look on Instagram or Twitter at EV Opinion. And I'll see you again soon. Take care, bye-bye.